So hello and welcome to another episode of TRU Talks with me, Chris Hill. Hope everything is, everyone is keeping well and safe during this uh, lockdown period at the moment. Uh, last week on the show, it was a pleasure to have Bristol Bears' is Tom Lindsay on and he was so open and so very honest about his journey in rugby. So if you haven't seen that, it's available on YouTube and we've just released a, a short podcast with all the audio on it this afternoon. So uh, do feel free to check that out because uh, it's a great insight from Tom and uh, many thanks to him again for giving up his time last week. And as you can see, we're joined by another guest this afternoon. It's a pleasure to welcome uh, Jacob Ford, who's currently the Westcliff head coach who compete in National 2 South, but also, of course, he is the brother of England International, George. Jacob, welcome to TRU Talks. I know we've spoken uh, a few times this season around Westcliff, but how's things with you? How's been? How's lockdown life been? Yeah, no, it's been good. I think um, it's given a lot of um, time to reflect um, you know, on a, on a lot of things uh, away from rugby as well as rugby itself, which, you know, you you normally wouldn't be able to do. So um, it's been interesting in that regard, you know, um, how you use your time, you know, the lots of time that we've had um, over the last uh, couple of months. Um, so, that, no, it's been interesting. It's been good learning. Um, and, you know, it makes you really excited and looking forward to the prospect of getting back to rugby, really. Yeah, you, you said before we started recording that you've been uh, helping out with the coffee shop, which you and your brothers have. So uh, you've been learning those skills as well as uh, as well in this downtime. Yeah, I mean, coffee is, um, you know, it's one of our hobbies as a family and something that we take, you know, a lot of interest in. And my brother's opened a, a coffee shop um, just outside Manchester before Christmas. And it's been a you know great success. And um, due to us isolating together as a family um, and the restrictions started to ease, we decided to open it up as a takeaway hatch um, as people walk past. Um, and, you know, I had the role as one of the baristas working with my <laughs> brothers behind the machine, uh, which was quite interesting. Um, all three of us were behind it at one point, which was um, which was good when demand got um, increased as the weeks went on. So, um, yeah, my barista skills have, um, have improved and um, I've quite enjoyed it, actually. And you mentioned as well that you're now back down south, back here, towards the Ipswich area in terms of at work. So how much have you enjoyed living down south over the last year or so when you made that move to Westcliff? Yeah, very, very different. Um, it's obviously a, a different part of the world that I'm, I'm not from and, and, and moving from from Loughborough, uh, which is quite accessible to, to the motorway. And, you know, you can you can nip back home and you can nip to Leicester, which is just around the corner where my my brother was or you know you can go straight up to Manchester I mean being down in Essex and Ipswich it's, it's, it's a long way away and um, very very different down here in the, the way they go about things but um, you know I think I've settled in really well um, you know I've really come to terms with the area and made a lot of friendships down here and um, you know I can see myself being down here for for a little while longer at, at least and I think there's a lot of um, opportunities down here for sure and something that um, you know I'm definitely definitely looking forward to yeah it's great to hear you speak so positively about the area Jacob because we caught up right at the start of the season we did a, a few things around the Christmas time as well and you spoke then about sort of the positive impact Westcliff has had on your life but just looking from a rugby perspective obviously the season was cut short due to the current pandemic we find ourselves in but if you look at the maths that were done by the RFU you guys finished I think it was 15 points clear at the end of any race relegation trouble so how do you how do you look back on the season and what's kind of your assessment of your first season with the club? Yeah I mean uh, lots of learnings lots of learnings from from me individually as well I think it, it's been great for that I've, um, I've definitely learned more um, through failing um, you know than you do anywhere else or I have anywhere else um, I feel like um, it was a great first season in terms of you know understanding who we're working with together um, understanding the environment and the people and um, you know I think that's really important that you, you get to know that in the first year and I think we did that um, I think you know the journey from when we started at the beginning of August towards the end was um, you know, it was, it was a long one and it was, um, you know, we, sh we showed clear signs of progression throughout the season. I mean, we didn't really get much of a pre-season, which always, you know, as I spoke to you before, put us on the back foot a little bit. Mm. Um, we missed out, you know, on a few results um, very narrowly. Um, and then after Christmas, fortune started to turn our way. Um, you know, impressive results at um, Red Cliffians away, um, you know, in, in February and, Obviously, old Albanians away um, were two two highlights for that, and um, I'd like to think as the season carried on, we would have picked up a few more results. But obviously, I'm going to say that that's it's very bad. <laughs> uh, but um, you know, I think lots of learnings, and I think it's put us in a great stead for next year. 
Um, and one of the things that we've you know discussed as uh, coaches and then management and senior players in the group is that um, we want to create an environment which people want to be a part of. And I think that's you know that's arguably more important than um, the technical part of it or what you coach and, and you know getting the culture and values right. Um, you know we'd like to think that in the period that I'm here and the coaching team are here, we'd like to leave ourselves an imprint there where we've, you know, uh, developed better people and we created a good environment that ultimately will last um, a little bit longer than just our time there. Yeah, it's interesting to hear about creating a culture and the environment. And when we spoke back in November, you said, obviously, it's been a long process of getting what you guys want to implement on the pitch. And you mentioned those wins after Christmas, but I know there was a couple of really standout wins, I think, against Red Roof and... Uh, Isha as well before that break so could you feel like things were slotting into place around the winter months and you were able to kick on in 2020? Yeah yeah I mean uh, you know I've always I always stay very positive I think that's one of my traits I'd like to think as, as a coach um, even when we were losing games narrowly or, or losing heavily away at the beginning of the season um, I always knew we were making big progressions and the wins were going to come uh, I think it's important not to you know we said this not not to set targets you know not to say yeah, we're going to win this game, this game, or we're going to get this amount of points, or we're going to do whatever, we're going to finish this high up in the table. I think it's more important to um, to worry about the, the values, because I think if you focus too much on um, on targets or what you want to achieve, you can you can come away from the process a little bit, or you can you can forget about the the, the things that actually matter and the things that um, that we want to develop as a team. And uh, we stuck to we stuck to it. We stuck to the process. Um, we took every week as it came, and you know those results against Isha and, and Red Roof were probably the first signs of um, where the tables were turning a little bit um, for sure. I think there were there were really good games in terms of the character we showed, um, and that's one thing I couldn't knock at all this season about the lads was the fight they showed even in in heavy defeats uh, they kept on going and um, they play for each other which is you know any coach I'm sure would agree that um, it's hard to coach that and if you have that in a team then it's it's almost half the battle really. And you say you know you weren't setting targets but I guess when you do get that win against all Red Cliffians that you say and I know you you were able to get good results against Sutton and Nepson and Bournemouth who were the teams that finished below you that must be positive as well because in a way, maybe in the back of your mind, I don't want to put words into your mouth there, Jacob, but you are thinking those are the games we need to target to get four or five points, which will possibly help us push up the table. Yeah, I think we didn't need to highlight the fact of after coming back from Christmas, uh, the Christmas break in 2020, we uh, we had three games. We had um, Sutton and Epsom at home, Red Cliffians away, and then Bournemouth at home, uh, the three teams below us at the time. We didn't need to highlight the fact that um, those were the games which would ultimately decide you know, uh, the standings at the bottom of the table. Um, we didn't put any extra pressure on ourselves or the lads. We stuck to what we knew. We stuck mm. to the process, which was really good and really positive. Um, and we got the job done. <laughs> you know, that's as simple as it is. You know, the, the Red Cliffians game away, we got off the bus, short warm-up. We warm up, warmed up on a pitch, which was, uh, you know, quite a while away, which was a good <laughs> five-minute walk from the club. And we thought, yeah, we quite like this, you know, old school. The game didn't re get recorded for whatever reason, so nobody actually knows what happened down there. And, um you know, we got a bonus point win, which was um, which was great, and that's just how we liked it. We got on the bus and we left. <laughs> um, that's how we you know, that's how we like to do things a little bit. So um, you know, it's really pre pleasing from that regard. But yeah, we didn't put any extra pressure on ourselves. We we put a little bit of pressure on the way we trained during the week. Uh, I think one of those weeks, I can't remember which one it was. We we actually trained against Rochford, who um, you know you might very well know they're coming yeah, into Nat yeah. next year, and they're just around the corner. Long history between the clubs and. Um, great rivalry and um, you know we managed to get a competitive training session with them which you know ultimately we got we learned a lot from and helped us perform at the weekend really yeah yeah and it was quite a strange thing and um, when I heard you were, were being announced as the head coach of Westcliff Jacob because we were actually doing some work at Penny Hill Park and we we're just about to interview George and I can't remember I think it was Darren actually at the club uh, rang us to say that um, you were going to become the head coach and that was quite a, a surreal moment for us but if you don't mind just talking about George and I know you, him and uh, your dad have been kind of in the headlines over the last week or so since Sam Burgess is featured on the House of Rugby podcast um, just first and foremost Jacob I mean what did you kind of make of the interview that, that, that Sam gave? Um, obviously, you know, the, these things, you know, they, they come out um, from nowhere almost and nothing can prepare you for them. 
um, you know, a little bit of a shock. Um, but, you know, I, the more you think about it, that, you know, that's sport. You know, that's, that's professional sport. It's what you sign up to. Uh, there's going to be people who, who like you and there's going to be people that dislike you. You know, this, I think the way you react to those things either way um, define who you are, um, you know, as a family or as an individual. Um, and I'd like to think, um, you know, the, the way, you know, my brother and my dad have reacted to, to such situation is, um, is very powerful, um, to be fair. And, um, you know, I think you learn from it. You learn from these things. You learn from, you know, when things get said about you that actually you learn about the things that actually matter in your life and um, the people you value and you care for. And ultimately, that's, those are the opinions we care about, the people who are close to us. Um, and that's all that matters, really, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, and that's ultimately what uh, we've concluded from it. And, you know, we don't worry about it. We don't lose sleep over it. Uh, we just crack on. And uh, we know that the people who support us and are around us um, care for us deeply. And, and that's all we care about, really. Yeah, because I was going to say, obviously, you're such a close-knit family, Jacob. I mean, what was, did George and your dad have much to say about it? Or is it like what you say there? It was just, right, this is out there. Let's just, you know, keep our composure. Let's not do anything silly and just move on from it. Yeah, I think, um, you know, when it, when, when it came out, it was, um, you know, you read it, you go through it, you, whatever was said, whatever allegations were said, and, you know, knowing you know, obviously we're going to be biased, but uh, knowing they're absolutely out there and far-fetched that we, you know, you just kind of laugh it off a little bit and um, you just move on. You move on and you, um, you know, that's why we came to the conclusion that, um, you know, the less you say, it's more powerful, um, you know, for sure. And it, it gives a better representation of who you are as, as an individual and what values you hold. You know, I spoke about values there, about Westcliff and, and stuff. And I think we... We as a family have very strong values and integrity is one of them, you know, on, honesty and, and, and respect. So we're, we're very, we're very uh, core to those values and um, we stick by them for sure. Yeah. I mean, do, do you think, it, obviously on the podcast, he is asked about his career uh, and obviously the World Cup's going to come up in, in 2015. But do you think it was strange that, um, that he started to stir up ghosts, if you like, from 2015? Because a lot of people may say, oh, he hasn't had the... The chance to say what happened but do you think to start bringing that all up again was a bit bit of a strange move from him yeah well you know it's uh, there's been a world cup since then um you know what i mean it's been it's been five years since since 2015 and um, i think you can you see a lot you know you learn a lot about people from the way they react to um certain things like i said like you know the, these things that come out and said about people and i think um if you take george for example he was um you know, looking back to 2016, uh, they went to Australia. He was dropped for the first test match. I think his reaction there uh, was very powerful. The way he came back, he came on, I think, after 20, 20 odd minutes. And um, he took the game, you know, by the scruff of its neck. And um, his reaction was so positive and, um, after that. And he did the same when he was dropped in South Africa. Um, so the evidence is there to show that um, he's an ultimate professional, um, ultimate professional. And obviously, I'm going to be biased because I'm his brother. Um, <laughs> but the evidence is there that he's, an, you know, he's an ultimate professional. And you know that team, um, that for whatever reason, I don't think I, you know the one thing I would say is I think it's very, you know, I, I don't think you can put you know, one reason of why a certain team fails. I think it's it's you know accumulation of a lot of things. And I think the bottom line is for whatever reason. You know, we all support England and they just didn't get it right in 2015. But, you know, the core group of players that, you know, left that World Cup stuck together. And, you know, you just look at the success that they've had since. They went through an undefeated 2016. They've won two Six Nations titles. They went to a World Cup final, um, you know, which, um, you know, fantastic World Cup campaign playing, fantastic rugby. And they've done that together. Um, they've done that together as a team. They've got better. Um, so I think that's very powerful, the way they've reacted to that. Uh, but, yeah, obviously... You know, to bring some up, that's five years ago when a lot of people have moved on. Um, you know, in, you know, look at Stuart Lancaster now; he, he's moved on and he's he's shown how um, you know how good he is as a coach, a fantastic coach. He's gone to Leinster and they, they, they've done fantastic things there. He's kept his head down. He's worked very hard, and now he's got a, you know a fantastic reputation of what a great coach he is. And um, you know, I think the way people react to things is uh, is very important uh, for sure. Yeah, and a couple of the journalists in, in my profession, Jacob, have written pieces on, on sort of Sam's interview since. And they said it was quite a ludicrous, one of them said it was a ludicrous statement to say that your dad was at fault for 
what happened in the World Cup. So I guess that echoes your point there that a lot of you know a lot of different factors. Who knows what they were from from me as a mere mortal to to look into it played a part in England's demise during 2015. Yeah, I mean, not none of, nobody outside that group will know um, you know what happened or uh, what the failings were. And but you know what is clear to see is the evidence that that group of players stuck together got better. Um, I do find it hard to believe that anyone outside that um, could influence, um, you know, certain results or certain, you know, characteristics of the team. I, I do find that hard to believe. Um, you know, regarding his, his, his comments about my dad, um, you know, the one thing I would say is I do think he's overstepped the mark um, with what he said and, you know, he's entitled to his own opinion and you've got to respect him for that. Um, but, you know, it's like, like you said, like I said before, it's, it's, it's extremely, extremely far-fetched, extremely out there, um, you know, without having <laughs> almost stone-cold evidence. It, it just, it, you just scratch your head a little bit at these things, you know, you go, oh, really? You know, kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, like I said, it's the reaction and the reaction to these things that make who you are and um, ultimately, um, you know, defines you, your character as a, as a person. And you, you've spoken well there about how your dad and, you, and George have been very quiet during this period. And I know Joe put a tweet and quite a, a, a personal Instagram message uh, on last week to say about how much of a selfless individual um, George is in particular and talked about his 90, uh, 69 caps he's got for England. And when me and you spoke, Jacob, during the World Cup, we touched on kind of that friendly rivalry that George has had with Owen over the years and I know since that South Africa game that you mentioned before that the battle for the 10 shirt has really been between those two guys and I guess when you do see George start in the World Cup final and have such a successful World Cup campaign as well you get that sense that he's put the team first but he's not let any disappointment have been dropped for Danny Cipriati or C. Owen taking the 10 shirt get to him he's just focused on on the team and then he's been rewarded by World Cup performances and even captain in England at stages as well. Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, you know, you can only get better as an individual and um, you can add, you know, you can add value to the team in other ways if you are dropped. And I feel like George has always put the team first. He's always put the team first. You know, it shows that um, by him being captain, like you said, on a few occasions, he's, he's very highly regarded, obviously, uh, within the squad. Um, but, you know, the evidence is there that, um, you know, the, the, these players that play for England, you know, you can name them all, these young players, the George, the Owens, the the Itorgis or, or whatever, they're very selfless individuals. Um, and, you know, obviously that's one of their core values and why they've been so successful. And I'm sure they'll be very successful in the coming years again. Um, that, that's what puts confidence in you as a supporter and someone looking in from the outside, that they do have these values and there is evidence to suggest that um, they do get better every day and they do strive to do the best for the team. Hmm. And, and Sam mentions as well in the interview, Jacob, that sort of his relationship with George sort of broke down for one reason or another after that Wales game. And he said that Sam being picked at centre, George went in a sulk about that decision. And Sam said it was because, claims it was because of the influence from his dad and sort of that fil and sort of filtered through to George. But is there just a possibility that a young George Ford of 21 years old who's playing at a home World Cup might have just been disappointed with the fact he'd, he'd been dropped for, for one of the biggest games of his career rather than just been an assault with one person in, in particular? I think, um, I think what, you know, if, if you were dropped for one of the biggest games of your, of your career, if you didn't show some form of um, emotion towards that, um, you know, then it could come across that, you know, does he actually care? Um, but, you know, I think, like I said, like whenever George has been dropped, he's, he's shown fantastic resilience and work ethic to get back to where he needs to get back to. Um, to, to suggest otherwise would be, um, would be very, like I said, very, very far-fetched and very out there. Um, but, you know, like I said, how, you know, letting external you know, factors influence you as an individual is not something that um, we as Fords, you know, um, allow us to do or um, I'd like to think successful individuals wouldn't allow the same um, you know I think I think I mentioned I was watching uh, reading not reading listening to Sam's uh, podcast and he mentioned that the Rabbitohs uh, were unsuccessful in the first attempt at the NRL final um, you know and he, he said he you know he allowed you know, the team allowed external influences to affect them with the media or whatever and then the next year they just focused on themselves. And I think he said, you know, when they step over the white wash, it's two teams against two teams. And you go out there and you do the best and play to the best of your ability. And you put everything else in the back of your head. Um, and then to suggest, 
you know, that external influences, you know, could possibly affect you, um, you know, contradicts that a little bit. But, you know, like I said, you know, we, especially as forwards, we don't allow these external influences to affect you and you stick to your values for sure. And you're obviously a passionate rugby family, Jacob, but I guess this maybe scenario about a dad supporting his son just relates to normal life, doesn't it, in a way? And Sam actually does say that. He just says, you, I can see where, you know, George and Mike are coming from. But it is that kind of, of course, if your son's not playing in a game, you're going to be disappointed as a father, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, 100%. I mean, but, you know, to suggest what he's suggesting is, uh, obviously, like I said, he's, he's very far-fetched and very out there. You know, what father doesn't care for his son or... Yeah. You know, you know, you know. For example, so um, yeah. Obviously, you know, there's there's definitely a line, and um, to what he's suggesting so far on the other side is, um, you know, it's it's hard to believe. Uh, it's very hard to believe. So um, yeah, like you said, you know, we're a very tight, close knit family, um, and we we know we hold. Um, we like to think we have very strong characteristics, so you know, we don't let things like this affect us. Yeah, one of the key quotes that you said as well. Jacob, when we did that interview around the World Cup, I think we, we talked about George not playing against, uh, not starting against Australia in the quarter final. And one of the quotes you said, which you've got in front of me here, actually, he says, I've just got, uh, I've just spoken to George and he said, I've got a different role this week and I've got to do that role as best as I possibly can. So if, even if that's bringing the water on, that's just the testament of the character George is, I presume. Yeah, I mean, he got dropped for the Australia game at the World Cup. You know, things you know things happen. You know, hey, what defines you is your reaction to that. I've always said that. So, um, you know, for him to come back, um, be selfless, and come on like Eddie said, I think he had, Eddie said that he came on in the last you know five ten minutes and, and, and close the game out. That was his role that week. Do it to your best of your ability, and then you'll succeed as a team. It's quite as simple as that. And to deviate from that would be ludicrous, especially in such World Cups, you know, probably the biggest tournament in rugby. So, um, you know, he's um, the way he reacts to things is, is very impressive and he goes about his own business and he keeps his head down and um, the evidence is there to show that. Yeah, and I'm sure like everyone at the moment, uh, George is wanting rugby to come back. I know there's a, a date penciled in for the 15th of August for the, for the Premiership to return. And in terms of you, Jacob, in terms of Westcliff, obviously we're, we're unsure about when the community game will... Uh, We'll be back, but how much have you learned as a coach this year from your time in National 2 South to, te- to take into next season, do you think? Oh, yeah, a massive amount. You know, I think um, the second season, you know, I'm really looking forward to in terms of working with the same core group of players, um, showing how far we've come, having a pre-season leading into next year. Um, and ultimately, we've learned a hell of a lot last year. Like I said, we've learned a hell of a lot about who we are, about how we want to play the game, the environment we're in how we go about things, um, those things that we must take into next year. And um, I'd like to think if we get those bits right, we'd, uh, we'll have a little bit of success, I'd like to think. But um, obviously we won't uh, put too many targets on things. Like I said, we'll, uh, we'll stick to the process and keep our values at heart and um, see where that takes us. Yeah, and you mentioned before as well that uh, Rochford 100 are now in the National 2 South, so looking forward to a bit of a, a local derby again next season. Yeah, no, definitely. I think somebody mentioned to me that we're the closest two teams in NCA in the leagues, I think. I think uh, it is, yeah. Yeah, which is, uh, doesn't surprise me because uh, it is literally just around the corner. Um, <laughs> but no, that, that, that's going to have a great, uh, you know, great environment and great anticipation for everyone involved. And um, hopefully there'll be, um, hopefully we will get two games and hopefully there will be good games for sure. And just finally from me, Jacob, obviously we're, we're not sure when rugby's going to return, but have you been able to do any sort of planning as, as a team at Westcliff for going into next season in terms of recruitment or getting training back going? Because I know you are allowed to do, am I right in saying, a bit of small group training at the moment? Yeah, we haven't, we haven't started training yet. Um, we're going to stick to, the, to the, uh, the plan that we had, which is not to start training yet. Um, and if anything changes on start dates or anything, then we can re- adapt accordingly to that. Um, but yeah, I mean, we... We pride ourselves on, on doing a lot of remote learning anyway. It wasn't um, the COVID stuff. So we, we use a lot of Huddle and um, a lot of examples on there and a lot of whatever we put on there. And, um, you know, the, the learning's done away from the field a, a lot of the time. So we've been doing a lot of that. Uh, we've also given the lads have had a lot of downtime, which they need after, a, you know, a very tough mm-hmm. season. Um, so I think, you know, I was hearing from the group, they're very anticipated to get back to training, looking forward to it, uh, looking to get stuck in. But uh, we won't start early we don't see any reason to do that um, we'll start on schedule and if we hear anything else then we can obviously change it 
Absolutely, absolutely. Well, we hope rugby uh, comes back at community level sooner rather than later, Jacob. But I really appreciate you taking the time to come on TRU Talk today and being so open and honest about the situation with your brother and dad. So thanks very much for that. And of course, it's always great to hear about events going on at Westcliff as well. So cheers for your time today, Jacob. Really appreciate it. And don't forget, obviously, we'll keep you up to date with all the latest that goes on, on in terms of the National Leagues on ncarugby.com and Talking Rugby Union. But that's been another special episode of TRU Talks. Thanks for, thanks for watching.